I give you a moment of silence to confess sin if necessary. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. It can't be learned nor lived in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do we get out of carnality and back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality by confession of sin? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the work of Christ on the cross extended to the Christian life on the principle of grace. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet to study with us the book of James on Wednesday night. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to us and for those who have a desire to be teachers, be sure you're gifted. Be sure you're mature enough to handle the responsibility of rightly dividing the word of truth. For you're held accountable for what you say on behalf of the Lord. I pray, Father, we would take all of this serious. Not sure we're serious about in the church anymore today in the 21st century. And James was in the first. James's group. So I pray about that today, Father. I pray about that. He's not talking about Sunday school teachers or those kind of issues. He's talking about men who represent God. And, and, and others respect them for that reason and listen to them to gleam faith to live by. I mean, they take all of that serious and, and be sure they will be held accountable for it. A stricter judgment. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the reasons, one of the reasons that the church ordains such men the evangelist that goes out to rep represent the gospel of grace, salvation, and basic doctrines, and the communicator, the teachers that go out and represent the doctrines that are necessary for spiritual growth, maturity, uh, the truth of the word of God under the new covenant. They go through a whole screening process for the church to put their their and let me tell you, I've been in this business a long time, and even when you put them through the whole thing, they don't. Sometimes they don't take all this stuff serious. First thing you know, they've they're wounded on the battlefield of the angelic conflict. Sometimes you can send a team in and rescue them, and sometimes you can't. It's serious stuff. I tell you, serious stuff. When people listen, when people sit under your ministry and make life-changing decisions based on it, people come to me and they want. We're having troubles in our marriage. We're thinking about getting divorced, and I go like, "Whoa!" People have lost a child, or they've lost a mate. Now, whoa, what do we do? Pretty serious stuff. I can tell you it's not for the faint of heart. I can tell you that because of the angelic conflict. I said, well, I'd like to be a teacher. Go to school. Teach kindergarten. Teach something else. You're gifted, and you ought to be trained. You ought to take this stuff seriously. Let me tell you, God does. When you go out and represent him, he takes it all serious. So here's point number one. The teachers James, the teachers that James are, is addressing is not the Sunday school type teachers that we might see in, school, in churches, but rather those spiritually gifted teachers like mentioned by Paul 
in Romans 12. Let's go to Romans 12, where he's talking about the gifted people. Romans, the 12th chapter. We're looking at 12. And we'll look at 6 through 8. 12. Back into verse 4, he's talking about the church body consists of many members, but one body. All members do not have the same function. Depends on their gift. Now, you can have many people with the same gift, but every people don't have the same one. So we who are many, are one body in Christ, verse 5, and individual members one of another. In other words, our gift is not to serve us. Our gift is to serve others. Your, feet is, your foot is not for yourself. It's not for your foot. It is for the body. That's the, that's the discussion of 1 Corinthians 12 along with Romans 12. Then in verse 6, and since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, you know how you get your gift? Don't get it from seminary. That's not how you get it. You get it from salvation. You get it from the Lord. He assigns it by grace. You get it by grace. You don't get it by works. Let each exercise them accordingly. Now he's going to list seven. These are not all there are. This is what he's listing to the church at Roman, uh, of Rome because they're having troubles with him. And so it's to correct them. If prophecy according to the portion of his faith, if serving in his serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And then he goes in at a whole discussion on conduct. Notice in verse 7, service gift is serving. Notice teaching, teach, teaches, teachers or in teaching Exhort in exhorting only three that are that way. The only three that are like that. The teacher teaches. The one who is in service or ministry ministers. The one who exhort exhorts. These are how these gifts function. The teacher teaches. Now, what he does with that, he, he, as we'll see, he's going to explain what he means by that, and it means that he teaches the word of God. He teaches doctrine. <clears throat> okay? And that's what my subject is about today. When he says he who teaches, notice the word whole, on, on that place uh, under point number one, spiritual gift. He who teaches, notice that's a participle. That we call that an articulate participle. And it, it identifies the gift. It identifies the gift. This is the way he's going to do that. He identifies the gift. Then there's a prepositional phrase. N plus the locative of sphere. This is the sphere of his gift. In his teaching, again, it comes with a definite article, te, or t, te. Notice the dasco, because it's a participle, right? Then he comes back, locative singular feminine. And notice it's the same word in a noun form with a, with a K-L-I-A 
rather than a verb who ends, which ends in an O. You understand that? Same, same what? In other words, in the sphere of is the function of the gift. So you have the gift. A person is gifted. He has a spiritual gift. Participle. Definite article. He's called the teacher. And what's a teacher do? He teaches doctrine. What, so you have the gift and you have the function. And the function is correlated to the gift. It's correlated to the gift. That's really important. Now the issue with James is what does he teach? In other words, he's talking about the tongue, what he says. He's going to be held accountable for what comes out of his mouth. So he has to learn to control what comes out of his mouth when he speaks on behalf of God. He needs to take this stuff serious because I'm going to tell you, when it comes out of his mouth, he's accountable for it. Look. I, did, I sat under some very good pastor teachers. When I became one, I'll tell you right away, the Holy Spirit of God made it very clear in my spirit that I was accountable for what came out of my mouth. Therefore, I became absolutely nutty about what these people said and to be able to back it up in my own sphere because I know I was held accountable for it, for what came out of my mouth. Not what came out of my pastor's mouth, but what was coming out of my mouth. That was a serious day in my life. That was a serious day in my life when that became reality. And I had a good pastor teacher. And I had a good one. I believe that that man dotted his I's and crossed his T's. I thought he was a good one. But when I began to speak it, I found out I better have my ducks in a row. I better know that when that's an I, I better dot it, and that's a T, and I better make sure that's a T. That's what James is saying. Because you're held under a stricter judgment when it comes out of your mouth. You better well know what you're talking about when you talk on behalf of God. It don't matter what your pastor thinks. It don't matter what his mouth told you. You'd better know what your mouth tells somebody else. That's what James is saying. Because you can't, see, when it comes out of my mouth and you're just a t an average guy going to church, growing on it, you can, you can talk about that. And they say, well, how do you know that? And say, well, my pastor showed it to me and this is what I believe. And they can come to me and I can show them. If you're the man out there and it's your mouth and it's your words, you better be able to back it up. You better be able to figure all that stuff out. You better figure all that out. Because you're held to a stricter judgment. You understand that? That's what James is talking about. It's exactly what he's talking about. Comes out of your mouth, you're held accountable for it. Notice the gift and the function are the same word. That's really important. That's why you have that gift. And you... you better well know when you speak on behalf of God what God has, is saying. Because that's a serious, serious thing. And he says you're held to a stricter judgment. We all stumble. You stumble in this. You're under a stricter judgment. I think that's what Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 
He said all scriptures inspired by inspired by God or profitable, you know, inspired God breathed. All scripture is God breathed, inspired by God and profitable for teaching. There's the same word. It's the same word. It's what you're teaching. You better know what you're teaching. How do you know what the scripture is saying? I mean, how do you know what the scripture is saying? Well, he said anybody can read it. Hmm, maybe. <laughs> Listen, the problem is not reading it. The problem is interpreting it. Anybody can read it. If, you, if you've got a fifth grade education, if you've got a fourth or fifth grade education, you can read the Bible. That's how it's written. That's Koine Greek. Put into English. We used to say to people, if you can read the Birmingham News, you can read the Bible. It's not complicated. Birmingham News was written off from that principle. Or less. <laughs> all scripture that's what he teaches teaches the scripture what's the teacher teach he teaches the scriptures the scriptures is God breathed is profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness you know how serious those are in a person's life. Do you know how serious that is in a person's life? That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That's how serious this is. Listen, this is how serious God takes it. And I'll tell you, if you're going to teach, you need to take it serious. You need to really take it serious. You need to you need to be able to dot your I's and cross your T's. So what James is saying, because it comes out of your mouth, you're accountable. When it comes out of your mouth, thus saith the Lord. Better have your ducks in a row. Point number two. Every church age believer receives a spiritual gift at the moment of grace salvation. Go back to Romans 12. You probably have your Bibles open. See, he says, for just as we have many members in one body. Let's see, I got three in the back table. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Myself is twenty. One upstairs. 22. This is how many I got in the body right here. Right? I got 22 members in one body. And every person in this room, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised on third, uh, from the dead on the third day, you have a spiritual gift. Because you live in the church age. You're under the new covenant. This is the way it runs. Now, You've got a spiritual gift. Your spiritual gift, listen to me now, is as important as your eyes. You think your eyes are important to your everyday life? Huh? You lose them, you do. I mean, it's, you know, or your hearing, or your feet. I'm just talking about the things we can see. I mean, how important is your heart and your lungs and your kidney and the things inside your body that make you one body? See, that's, that's what he's talking about here. We, we are all, and all the members do not have the same function. Your ear has one function for what? The body. What is the body he's talking about? Here is the church. Both universal and local. I'm going to teach on that Sunday. Look, your value to us at Doctrinal Study Bible Church is not that you just come to church, but that you become the church. 
Do you hear the difference? At some point, we want you to be, be, be engaged in the body of Christ. You have a gifted service to us. That's why God has brought you here. You say, no, I was drug here. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. But that's not true. Back in your heart, there's a reason why you're here because if you didn't want to be here, you're bullheaded enough not to come. But you do come. And I'm so thankful for it. I want you to understand that you live under a new covenant. And one of the great things about being the church is that you're already a member. You say, I've never joined. Oh, yeah, you did when you got saved. Look, see the word member? He's used it two ways. One with the body and one with the church. Agreed? He called it a member. Like your arm is a member of the body. Your ear is a member of the body. Your eye. If, if you want to know more about that, then you should read 1 Corinthians 12. Not now, but later. Because he's going to tell you the same thing and he's going to use a, 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 a body analogy to do it. See, we, we, all of us are members at the point of salvation you became a member. Now look at the local body is where you go to be, be fed and have your gift exercised and do a lot of other things, fellowship, prayer, all these kind of things that are important. But listen, as far as the body that you're connected to, your gift is the key. Your growth is where prayer comes. Your growth is where fellowship comes. Your growth is where a lot of things come from. But look, you're, the gift you have. You've been given this gift at salvation. I don't know when you got said, well, I didn't know it. Well, that's because nobody taught you. When I was a little boy, when I was a little boy, I thought my name was Homan. My grandparents married, uh, raised me. My grandparents raised me, and their name was Homan. I thought I was Ronnie Homan. When I went to the first grade, the teacher kept calling out Adama, Ron Adama. I never answered. She was a local lady. This is one room with eight grades and one teacher. Okay. It was the best education you could have ever hoped to God because you got repetition. Well, anyhow, you knew the first eight grades. Well, I never answered. I never heard my name. So she stepped, she came, her name was Phyllis Brainy. She stepped up in my eyesight, stepped up into my presence and said, how come you didn't answer me? I said, I never heard my name. She said, well, what do, you, what do you think your name is? I said, it's Ronnie Holman. Well, everybody in the class agreed. Yeah. All the Schultz, boy, all the Schultz, boy, Schultz boys went, yeah, that's who that guy is. Yeah. She said, no, your name's not Holman. Uh, I was not a happy camper. She just ruined my day. And our, our school just began. By halftime, I was wanting to go home. I'm going to get, I want to get some answers on this deal. And I told her, I said, no, I think. I said to her, I think I know who I am. <laughs> but I was pretty confident of who I was. And I went home and I asked my grandmother. I said, the teacher said, my, I'm not a homan. She said I was some kind of, and I couldn't even remember the name. So I understand your problem with it. I, and I said, she's got a, a, some A word. She said, well, you're, you're an Adama. And it, my world changed. My world changed. So you say, 
no matter how, what you perceive, I didn't know I had this, I didn't know this. Well, at some point in your life, you discover this because it's the truth of the Word of God. How do you know? I know because I've studied Romans 12 chapter. You want to know? You study 12. You want to know because you can study 1 Corinthians 12. will tell you the same thing in greater detail. Yeah, see. What is your gift? That's a big question. So once you're part of a local church and you keep saying you've been there five years, you've been active, you know some actually know some people by name. Jeez. If you're not sure after four or five years what your gift is, ask them. They'll probably tell you because they have been blessed by it. Wouldn't that be good? That might be good. So, here we are in 1 Corinthians. You can look over, over and let me just go, go to Corinthians. Here I am in Romans. I'm one book over. Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Listen to this in 4, 5, and 6. I love this in 4, 5, and 6. And sometime this year, I'm going to do gifts again. So he's talking about spiritual gifts. Verse 4. Watch this. In, watch 4, 5, and 6. Listen, any time you see the Godhead on, on some doctrinal issue, I can't tell you how big a deal that is, right? I mean, that's the big deal. Now, watch this. Now, look for the Godhead, the Trinity, or the Godhead. Look at verse 4. I'm, I'm in 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Now, there are a variety of gifts, spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. Notice that's capital S. Same Holy Spirit. There are varieties of ministries because a gift has a ministry and the same Lord. The, these are, these are in charge of that. Who's in charge of giving the gifts? Holy Spirit. Who's in charge of giving the ministry? Lord. His responsibility. So they have responsibilities. And there are varieties of performances or effects. The same God who works all things in all things. You see, you have the Trinity they're all that. They're they're one person at different functions. The the character of them, three persons, the same character, right? You know the essence box of God. They're three different persons with three different functions in regard to gifts. The Holy Spirit distributes them. You you can read that in twelve. The Lord operates the ministry. And God, they function in the master plan of God. He works all things in all things, right? I mean, that's, I mean he's, he's the CEO of the program. <laughs> so I tell you, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 chapters are really dynamite on this subject. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11 through 13, watch the word one. Always look for markers. Pay attention to the word one. And it means one like one, two, three, four. The one and the same Holy Spirit works all these things. Distributing to each one individually just as he wills the master plan. According to the master plan, it ha no, no matter what it is, it fits. The, who's the CEO? God, for even as the body is one and yet has many members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, the word one is used seven times if I counted right. Always check my counting if I counted right. Do you know the next word in there that should be called for a marker is the spirit, right? That's the next one, the Holy Spirit. See that? 
used three times, clear as a bell. Clear as a bell. I don't know what clear as a bell is. Huh? What does that mean, clear as a bell? I know you'll tell me afterwards, so spare me now. But I've heard that all my life, and it's, I go like, clear as a bell. I think it's related to when you hear a bell. Yeah. It rings so bell. loud and clear. So Thank you. I, I got it before the class was over. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, clear as a bell. I got it. Thank you. William, I now know why you're in my life. <laughs> clear as a bell. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I'll get back on my subject in a minute. At 3 o'clock in the morning, the train goes through, trustful. I love that sound. Eh, I love that sound. I can hear it clear as a bell, William. You're right. Clear as a bell. I can hear that thing. I love it. I love it. I think he wakes me up. I think the Lord wakes me up at 3 o'clock just to give me a little thrill. Listen to this. And I, I hear it just as clear if I was set next to the railroad track. And I love that sound. I think I love it because I'm alive. I woke up and I'm live. I'm still alive. <laughs> I don't know, but I like that sound. I like that sound. Every, every morning at 3 o'clock, I get that. Here we are. Here we are at point three. James warns spiritually gifted teachers about one problem area of a teacher, his mouth, and in regard to his gift, not his mouth in other ways. He'll deal with that later. In the third chapter, verse two, he says, for we all stumble. Now, this is not the word. This, this is not the same Greek word that was used with Peter. When Jesus said, you are a stumbling block to me. That's a whole different Greek word. This is a stumble. This is stumble like stub your toe business, you know. It's short pain, but you don't have to go to emergency room, right? I just, for some reason tonight, I'm wanting to talk. And I've got to shut that thing down because I'm just about, well, hey, let's just have a cup of coffee and talk. <laughs> Right, that's where I am. Right <laughs> and I'm at point three. Uh, we, we, we all stumble in many ways, yet does not anyone, let's see, that, something's wrong with this. For we all stumble, anyone who does not stumble in what he says is how that should go. Yeah. In the sphere of what he says, in, in, the, the, in what he says, is in the sphere of what he says, and that's whole, that's logos, and he's referring to his tongue in regard to the word of God, the communication of the word of God. He is a teleos. He is a complete or mature man because if you can control your tongue, you can control your body because you've learned the principle. You've learned the principle of how to does it, and that is God. God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is perfect, a spiritual mature believer like 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in grace, grow in grace and knowledge. That's how you get to be a mature man. That's Aner, by the way, and not Anthropos. That's Aner. That's a, a, spe a special or specific man. Able, you know, that kind of looks like a verb the way it's used and it's not. It's dunatas. And he's talking about the inherent spiritual power. The, the mature man has the inherent spiritual power, both of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the word of God that he speaks on behalf of. He has inherent power. Look, here's what he means. This per, Of all the people you would meet in your life, there are two things that he should have that's on the front burner of his life all the time. One, it, first inherent power is the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, number one. Number two, th th this is, should be right up front in his life. 
if he's going to speak on behalf of God, he should ha be in contact with the inherent power. And the second one is you walk by faith and not by sight. Inherent power. The two characteristics of the man who speaks on behalf of God to other people and encourage them in their life of walk should understand, should have, in, should be in touch with this inherent power system in his life. Of all people you meet, that guy ought to be there. If he's a spiritual mature man speaking on behalf of God, those two inherent powers are actively engaged in his life if he has any kind of ministry. And the more he's engaged in that internal power, that inherent power, the greater his ministry impact is going to be through his gift. The impact of that gift on people. Look. Let me show you what I mean. The, Jesus said when his disciples are ready, when his disciples through their study and their growth are ready to be sent on a mission trip, he sends them out as apostles. You with me? This is where they first become known as apostles. He sends them on a mission trip of apostello. He sends them out. And he tells them exactly what to say and how to do it and how to operate. They do it. And they come back and they're amazed. I mean, wow, we have. He sends them, and so he waits a while, and he sends them out on a second trip, and they fall flat on their face. Yeah, did the very same thing they did on the first one, and came back and fell on their face. Came back. Oh, they, they couldn't figure out what happened. What happened? We went out and did the same thing. What happened? Right? We couldn't cast out demons. We couldn't do anything. Oh, what happened? He said, I'll tell you what happened. You didn't take ownership. You took no ownership. You took no ownership of the responsibility that I gave you. I gave you authority. You took no responsibility for it. You just thought you could go out and do it, that it would fly on its own. And so I let you go out this time. I'll let you fall on your face because I'm going to tell you, this, you should have went out prepared. You should have prayed and fasted and you should have taken ownership of the responsibility of this, but you didn't. You thought you could fly by the seat of your pants. You cannot. That's an inherent power. Taking ownership. You need to take ownership. If you're going to speak on behalf of God, take ownership on your days off. <laughs> Gee whiz. Yeah, there's no days off. I'm being facetious. There's no days off. Days off. Let me tell you, if you got days off, you know who sees it? Your family. They, you know what they call you? Phony baloney. Now, William will tell me in a minute what phony baloney is. <laughs> phony baloney. There are no days off on this deal. Listen, you're always, you're always, if, if you're engaged in the word of God and you th know that you are part of that program out there, listen, you're always, you're always in ministry. Days off? Why do you want to be something you're not? You want to be something you are. The truth of the matter, you're always who you are. But you need to become who Christ wants you to be. Days off? I mean, my family taught me that. Gee whiz. Man, if you don't learn that from me, family, you didn't learn anything. Well, I don't know. My kids, eh? They were saying to me all the time, can I speak to the new man? No, and I should, I should have held that doctrine back. Can I speak to the new man? I said, well, you'll have to give the old man a moment <laughs> because I'm about ready to tear the house up right now. 
Yeah, can you learn from that? 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 But uh, he, he pushed my nose in it. He pushed my nose in it. I'm not one to like to have my nose pushed in stuff. <laughs> but he pushed my nose in it. I've become a learner. Let me give it, let me give an example of how not to use your your mouth as a teacher. Here's one. Telling people what they want to hear rather than to tell them what they need to hear. Telling people what they want to hear rather than telling them what they need to hear. You know what you know what the Bible calls that? Men pleasers. You can forget that. He'll shut that thing down. He may give you people. They won't come from him. You may have people that listen to you because you always tell them what they want to hear. You can find a following group like that. First Thessalonians 2, 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. Now, you can't fool God for one minute. You can fool everybody for an hour, but you can't fool him for a minute. You ought to read Galatians 1.10 if you're interested. Not now, but later. Here's another one. Failing to tell people the truth regarding certain sins because the teacher has not conquered them in his own life. So you never hear that pastor talking about certain sins. He's never going to talk about it because he hasn't been able to conquer and therefore he knows. He can't. Hey, I've got no advice for you. You know, you know, the first guy that ought to be conquering sins if he wants to talk about to other people is the guy who's teaching. I don't know how other people get away with it. Man, I can't get away with any of that stuff. He chokes me down. Romans, the, Romans 125 talks about exchanging the truth for a lie. Some people don't do it. They just avoid it. They stay away from certain issues. Why would you do that when people are bleeding? Well, because I'm bleeding too. Well, then why don't you fix it? The Word of God, the Word of God is the most powerful thing in your life. Man, be super glue. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 15, speaking the truth in what? Love. We are to grow up in all aspects unto him. In all aspects. Got any aspect in your life that's not growing up? What area is that? Why isn't that? Why have you got that area still stuck in there? How come that thing's not conquered? I'm speaking to, listen, I'm speaking to Rod Adema. I'm a teacher. How about this one? Teaching doctrines that are not compatible with grace in every aspect of the Christian way of life. I don't understand that. Grace is the greatest doctrine of the new covenant. It's what separates all. It's what, it's what divides everything and puts it in the proper order is grace. We tried to make this really simple in, in our church in trying to teach people about grace. We put it in the six stages of growth, six stages of the Christian way of life. We call it the six stages of grace just to try to make it simple, kind of like the faith cycle, just trying to bring it into some kind of simplicity. Grace and salvation, grace and living, grace and suffering, grace and growth, grace and dying, grace surpassing grace. I mean, we just tried to bring it to you in a very simple manner to make you understand that it's all about grace. Not to make it complicated in your life, to make it simple. Grace, God does it. God, God, grace. I told the kids the other day uh, up at uh, the conference I was at, when you look at grace salvation, he, God wraps that all up in a box, a nice neat box of, of salvation. He does this nice big box. And you know what it is? It's a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. Is what? 
It's a gift. See, salvation, you wrap that, he wraps that all thing up. It has nothing to do with you. It comes from God. It's, it's, a, it's a gift, like a Christmas gift or a birthday gift. It's wrapped up. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. Somebody else's character gave it. It wasn't based on your character. It wasn't based on anything about you except, except some connection that you had with another person that took it upon themselves out of their goodness and their good character to give you a gift. Do you know when I got saved and I understood the grace gift it changed my whole life about getting gifts from people because I realized in my, my life that it was the character, there was something unique about the character of the other person that was attached to me that they would give me a gift. Now you think about that a minute. I learned that not because I got gifts. I learned that because I got one gift from God that was special in my life and it changed my whole attitude about gifts in my life from that day forward because I discovered something about them. When you read 1 John 5 through the second chapter, verse 2, I want you to pay a special attention to a special phrase in there that divides us up in a wonderful way. If we say. And he divides this whole section up or from verse 5. This whole thing, the thesis of that whole passage is verse 5. And it answers arguments of theology that are being attacked. If we say such and such, then he gets like verse 6. If we say, and then verse 7 gives the answer. Verse 8, if we say, that shows the false teaching. Verse 9 gives the answer. Verse 10, if we say, gives the false, and then the rest of it down to verse 2 gives the answer. The correct answer. You know what that is? That's teaching the truth amidst false teaching. It's correcting. Just be sure you're on the right team. Be sure that what you're speaking has the answer to false teaching and that it's grace-oriented. I wrote all that on your paper. Listen to 2 Timothy 4.2 in closing. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. I, I tell my guys around here, always have one in your hip pocket. And I'll tell you, the mature guys around here have them. There is no emergency in my life that I can't call one of the guys on our team that they are not ready immediately to step in and, and take it. I mean, I don't care what time of night. I don't care when it is. They always, every one of these guys that are on our team, always have one in their hip pocket. Always. I always have one in mine. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. See that word instruction? That's doctrine. Listen to the warning of James tonight. Let not many become teachers, my brethren, or stop knowing that as such we shall incur stricter judgment. That's what James found out. And I did too. Okay? Let's close in a word of prayer. Then we'll have a, a moment of prayer time. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us out of James 3, 1 and 2. For those who desire to be teachers, they need to be men who have the word of God work in their life first.
and see the power of the word of God to change, to exhort, to rebuke, to train, to do all the things that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells them. To begin to spiritually grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and reach that status where everything that comes from the mouth has been checked and double checked and triple checked to be sure that it is what the Father says at the right time to the right people for the dynamics of the life changes in there that will occur in their life because of the power of the Word of God. I pray for that. James is already in the early church having trouble with it. And we're thankful for all that he learned and shared with us, Father, through your sign-off on it as it becomes recorded in the Word of God. Encourage our hearts, Father, those who have the gift to understand the responsibility. It's a gift with a lot of responsibility. But what an impact it has in the body of Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.